Now on Zero Block 30, we are joined by Ken Croak of the book Riding with Evil, which has been described as Sons of Anarchy meets The Departed. He is the first ATF agent to infiltrate the pagan motorcycle gang. No big deal. And this whole story, so the book just came out and this whole story is just, I'm trying to imagine I can't, I can't fake anything. I'm an open book. You can see on my face. I'm, I give away every emotion that I'm feeling, how you go undercover long-term with a motorcycle gang and uh, quite honestly live to tell the tale about it is incredible. So you started off in Los Angeles in the nineties, street gangs, busting drug rings. How, how did it evolve to this? So when I was, um, and you're right, I, my, you know, so I'm originally from Boston, but I, my first assignment, I was sent to LA and, um, you know, coming fit out right of the in academy, there, Boston guy yeah. will fit right in. Nobody will know. Yeah, not hard to explain a Boston <laughs> accent when yeah. you're going everywhere. Um, but I actually went through some training to get the accent dropped. Um, but really? I will say, you know, yeah, it, 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 give me a couple of pints of Guinness in the, in the, uh, Accents right back at you. Um, but anyhow, the um, and so, you know, it, I always felt like, you know, people kind of stereotyped like, oh, you know, you'd have to be minority or female or this or that to do these different roles. And, and I think there's some truth to that. But for the most part, it's really what your backstory is and what your introduction is going to be. Um, you know, and I did a lot of um, a lot of undercover work with gangs, um, you know, African-American gangs, Hispanic gangs, white gangs. Um, in my time in LA and it was, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a white guy. And, um, you know, back then I had a long ponytail, long hair. Now I have no hair. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's because of the work, but it's, um, you know, really just, it's how the intro is. And then, you know, how quickly you can think on your feet. Um, and, you know, cause you, you could script out all day long, like, Oh, I'm going to go in, I'm going to say A, B and C. And as soon as the first conversation starts, it runs off in a different direction. You just have to be able to adapt quickly. Yeah. And I mean, we, so we just have covered a couple of recent big stolen valor stories in the Marine Corps while like in the military world. And it's people who they took the time to step back and learn the culture really well before they started dipping their toes in and like picking up pieces here and there. And then next thing you knew, like nobody, um, the, one of the women that we were talking about, she became the leader of her local VFW. She had all these major roles and nobody had a clue. She was so good at it. She had all the... Um, and these were actual veterans, military veterans that she had entrenched herself in, and none of them were the wiser. So, you know, if you pick up on enough of the culture, I guess, of any, of any community, it, is that what it was like? I think that's actually a great analogy. If you, um, for me, it was cause I, you know, I wasn't really raised in, in that inner city type environment or with gangs for sure. And when you talk to them and you listen to them and you debrief them at some point, you'll start to understand what that world is in what makes it work. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you know, as long as you're not trying to, you know, I'm not going to be able to say hey, I'm a shoreline crip. I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to play that. But if, if I'm playing somebody who may do business with the shoreline crips and, and I'm comfortable in that role, and uh, then, then you could fit in. And what made you, was it the ATF that told you this is the route you're going, or did you volunteer to do this? So, you know, part of it, so the ATF does not make anybody do undercover. So okay. um, that's the first, other than when you're in the academy, when you're in the academy, you have to try it, uh, but it's in a safe environment you know, mm -hmm. in the academy. Um, but when I came out, um, I always just felt like certain um, folks got stereotyped into doing this. Um, and so my wife's a Hispanic female and, and she was an agent and um, she was put into undercover assignments, you know, um, based on her race. And I always felt like that wasn't fair. And I also felt like there's other ways you could do it. And so I kind of took that on as a challenge and, um, you know, found out I was pretty good at it as and developed, you know, you know, in early parts of my career. And I liked the challenge and, uh, you know, a, a short, quick story. The first undercover op I had done out in Los Angeles, it was actually for stolen explosives from a mil military base out by Barstow. And um, I got out there and had done a few, you know, ops back to back. And uh, I was like, this is great. You know, you had this adrenaline high. And I remember driving back to my apartment in LA and I stopped and picked up, picked up some, uh, some burgers along the way. Got in my apartment, sat on the couch, um, put the burgers on the floor, sat back for a second and woke up four hours later from the adrenaline cr crash. I, so the burgers stone cold. Wow. And that's when I realized like the stress that you actually are under when you do this, even if you don't feel it when you're doing it. 
Yeah. And I imagine that's something kind of like a high you want to keep chasing. Like it's that exciting. I mean, I know that's incredibly stressful, but it's also so exciting outside everyday life that you probably come, is it, you want to keep chasing that sort of like. Well, you know, I think it was the challenge of it. it yeah. in every role is different. And when I was in California, that was my first real exposure to all the motorcycle gangs. Yeah. And, um, and so I'd done some work um, on the Mongols and on the Vagos and, um, and so I, you know, had some, you know, interest in doing that. And I did a lot of um, white supremacy uh, work out in uh, LA in the deserts and then out in um, Colorado and out to Kansas. So, um, you know, one thing led to another and, and you know, had some of these roles and, and always found it a challenge and was always willing to do it. And, um, you know, I think the, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then the more people want you to do it. Right. Um, because everyone's got their cases and they're not going to do the undercover or they don't have the skill set to do it. And so they'd be like, Hey, you know, Ken, could you come over and do this? And, and a lot of it's quick, you know, you might do one or two buys, right. most of them are two year assignments. And that's what this turned into for you with the pagans. So eventually you move on to Colorado and that's where you get more involved. How, how did the pagans specifically come into it? So the pagans were when I was um, in Boston. And um, in, in the case, you know, again, people are always like, oh, how did you ever commit to doing a two-year assignment? Well, it was never supposed to be a two-year assignment. I mm -hmm. never signed up for a two-year assignment. It, it turned into that. And, and the way it started is, is an informant who came in um, to one of the groups in Boston with some information and um, that he had on the Devil's Disciples, which is kind of a support club for the pagans. Yeah, the big... The big clubs have a bunch of support clubs that are aligned with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so th they came in and, and uh, or this informant had come in and provide some info. They came and vetted off me because I had more biker experience than anyone else in the division. So we talked it through and put him on the polygraph. He passed the polygraph. And so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll go with him to meet some of these guys just to see what this is about, see if it's worth, you know, running an investigation on. But the one thing I needed to do was meet his wife. Mm -hmm. Because my story with him was going to be that we knew each other from uh, the Beach Street projects in Rosendale. And if I had known him for years, then his wife would obviously know me. And so I want to make sure she could stand up to the um, to the background and, and, and if she got questioned about me. Um, and so went and met with her. Um, she was actually more squared away than he was. Mm -hmm. And so I felt comfortable that, you know, at least short term, it could work. And, and during that encounter with her, um, very shortly after there was issues in a hot water heater. And it was long story short is I, I met, but just by happenstance, one of the devil's disciples um, helped him fix his hot water heater. And that led to an invitation to a party and went to the party, met a bunch of de other devil's disciples and, and it went from there. And at some point, not too far down the road, because the intent was that I would go meet some of these and then bring somebody and introduce them and let them do the long term. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it went so fast and way faster than we had planned on. So you fix his water heater, you get invited to this party and things start happening really, really quickly. And this is a stupid question. Did you already ride motorcycles at this point? Like, did you already have a thing for them or you had to develop that really fast on the fly? No, that's a, um, that's not a stupid question. And, and, um, yes, I had been riding motorcycles ever since I was a kid, okay. you know, dirt bikes. Not like, bikes. All right, Ken, um, hop on your, and you're like, Oh shit. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I, I will tell you a side story and I won't say who it was, but there was an agent who, um, you know, was going on an infiltration on a biker gang, never into bike. And he literally, um, he tipped over, uh, on his first escapades out. So, um, it, it you know, it, and you could build that into your story. You can make your story right. part of anything. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I was familiar with bikes. I had done a fair amount of riding, not at the level that these guys rode or mm -hmm. at the speed or on uh, the formations, but, um, yeah, I had done a fair amount of run. So you go to this party though, and you start meeting other people, things are moving quickly. And, and this was just somebody from one of the side groups you had met. How did you link up with the main group? And when did you start to, cause it's a big deal. It takes a while really to gain their trust, right? How did you do that? Yeah. So, you know, it was, again, it was never supposed to be me. It was going to be, I was going to be there and I was going to bring somebody in for that intro. Um, but then all of a sudden really quickly after this, I had, there was two individuals, Boston Bob and um, an individual known as uh, Billy Jacobson. And he, these two were kind of vying and they were openly talking about, we are starting a pagan chapter in, in Boston. And uh, both had told me separately that they were going to be the presidents of this chapter. And I was like, yeah, sure. So we would go to a bar down in South Boston and meet up. So I was building a relationship with him. And then Boston Bob, I'd meet with a bar out in Western Mass and I was building a relationship with him. Anyways, fast forward, um, 
they were going down. So a pagan prospect um, was murdered and um, they had an event for him. Now, the pagan prospect being murdered did not help my um, odds of ATF, you know, endorsing me becoming the next prospect for the right. you know, to replace the murdered one. Um, but th th this event was going to happen down. There it was a two, two day event. So the two of them were going down on Friday night and I was going to meet them down there on Saturday night. And that was going to be my first time meeting the pagans down mm -hmm. in New York. Um, they go down to a bar called Mobo's on Long Island. And when they're there, um, and, and I'd heard about this before from Boston Bob that um, Billy had been hooking up with this female um, down in New York. And he had been warned by Boston Bob, like, hey, she's affiliated with the pagans. You do not want to be messing around with this girl. This is going to come back. It's going to bite you. Like, this just, it's a mistake. And, and Billy's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He kind of blew him off. Anyways, long story short, they show up at this bar. When they walk in, this, this uh, female, sees him before he sees her and she points out to her new boyfriend who happens to be a president of one of the pagan chapters Ugh. and says see that guy over there um he raped me now maybe he did rape her uh maybe he did i don't know i never was able to get to the back part of it um and you'll hear why in a second so um four pagans lure him into the bathroom which is the bathroom sounds like why would you go in the bathroom it's like you know going behind where they hide chainsaws in a horror movie um, but that's where these biker clubs do a lot of their activity and they're controlled bars. The bathroom is either where they're using drugs, selling drugs, doing whatever transaction. So it wasn't abnormal. And he's thinking, Hey, I'm going in here. They're going to name me the president of the new chapter, blah, blah, blah. So he walks through the door, the door closes and they beat the crap out of him. They beat him mm -hmm. unconscious. He wakes up and all four of them are urinating on him. Um, mm -hmm. and the urine is actually what wakes, wakes him up. Um, they then beat him unconscious again. And then they bring Boston Bob into the bathroom and they say, hey, take Billy, get him back to the motel. We're going to come back there. We're going to cut his dick off and we're going to throw him in a dumpster. And so Boston Bob's like, OK, I got you because Boston Bob's thinking I'm next, you know, because he doesn't know the full story and what's happened. Right. So he takes him out of there. Um, and as he gets him in his car, he's soaked in urine and in, in semi-conscious it all of a sudden dawns on him like, hey, I left Boston with this guy. If I don't come back with this guy and they find him in a dumpster, it's coming back on me. So he wisely decides, OK, it's time to leave New York. He drives all the way back to Boston, pushes Billy out of the car in front of the Somerville Hospital and drives drives off. And then I get a text at like 430 in the morning and it says and it's from Boston Bob trips off. I'll explain later. So I try to call him. I don't get anything. I'm trying to call Billy. I'm not getting anything. Eventually, I do get one call from Billy. It was very short. And he said, get out. You don't want to be around these guys. Get out while you can. And he's like, you're never going to hear from me again. Hang mm -hmm. up. Never heard from him again. And that was it. He was gone. So yeah. I never really got the full story because he was he was out of the case. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great intro to the pagans. I mean, really, yeah. the insanity that is yeah, rough first yeah. day, rough first day. Uh, but and two. Before we get too far into this, what sets the pagans apart? Because I'm like, oh, a pagan is a hell's angel, is a Mongol, is a whatever. Like, they're all the same, really. What sets them apart from other gangs? Other so they all kind of have their own, they all kind of have their own personalities, um, the clubs. They're, you know, out of the big five. Um, but by far, so the, the, the pagans last year uh, were reported, uh, you know, when they do those intelligence reports in law enforcement, they uh, were the most violent of the big five gangs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I am looked at the last few years reports. I just happened to look at the last years, but I'm betting they are almost every year. They're different from other gangs where when they do their mandatories, they're sleeping in dirt fields. Um, they're, and they're a mandatory still, is, it's kind of like in the military getting called to formation, like you better be there kind of thing. You have to, that's a perfect good analogy. You have to be there uh, okay. unless you're physically unable to be there. So if there's a mandatory and they'll say, okay, um, like one of them was in Youngstown, Ohio. Every pagan from everywhere had to be in Youngstown, Ohio over this four day weekend and you had no choice. And um, so like the, <sighs> That they when they go to these things, they're sleeping in dirt fields. There's a lot, you know, drugs, you know, fights. But there's also a lot of gang activity, like planning for Mother Club, which is the national hierarchy that runs the entire gang. And then there's chapters that make up the you know the subsets. And so now other gangs, 
they're staying in five star hotels. Um, you know, they're staying or motels at least, at least where there's running water. Um, and these guys aren't into the money. They're into the violence, the intimidation. That's their thing. So that's probably um, part of the allure is how down and dirty it is, is sleeping in the fields and being like, oh, that makes us tougher than all the others. A hundred percent. And it's also, you know, they were known to traffic in firearms and explosives. And I bought bombs, I bought guns um, and they were violent. They would blow people up. They would kill people. And so that was part of why this gang was, one and they they're very surveillance conscious they had never been infiltrated by law enforcement that was their claim to fame until i came along and um there's a reason for it because you can't get to the hierarchy from the outside they're very insulated Mm -hmm. and um by getting in and then moving up i actually became an officer to win the club by doing that we were able to get to some of that hierarchy and so what year was this that so now you were working gangs in la with the atf you make your way to boston you get this intro you have an in to start making your way and you're sort of a recruit. You're not fully even a pagan yet. So they have you doing all these different tasks for them that I'm assuming were highly illegal a lot of times, right? So, so the, the basic phase is you have a hang around phase, which is almost like a honeymoon phase where you get to go to their parties. Um, there's no stress on anything. You don't have to do anything. They're just having you around, but they're sizing you up that entire time. Mm-hmm. Once you get past that, then they're going to put you in the prospect phase that is living hell. Um, okay. You uh, belong to the group. You're basically a slave. Um, 24-7, you're called to do all sorts of different things, but you're not in the inner workings. You're not part of their criminal activity. You are um, not in on the meetings where they're doing that. Um, and you are constantly under mental duress or physical duress or both. Um, and and you, you don't even belong to a chapter. You belong to the entire organization. So basically anybody who wants to screw with you is going to screw with you. So one example at those mandatories, they would have what they call the witching hour. And about two o'clock in the morning, they you know, had these strung out pagans that would just go on the hunt for prospects and they would just beat them. And, and their weapon of choice was ax handles. And people are often like, oh, an ax handle, that's not that big of a deal. An ax handle is a baseball bat. It, it, there's like, these are real ax handles. They're not like the little one for a little machete. And, um, and they would beat these, you know, beat prospects regularly. And, um, and if you break certain rules, if you do certain things, out of say, you're, you're going to get beaten or thrown out or both. Um, and if you can get through the prospect phase, which is a minimum of six months, then you would become a patch. And, and so then you're a patch and then you can go into officer status, you know, depending on how long you last. And what were some of the most difficult parts of the prospect phase for you? Oh, um, pro- probably entire- getting beaten with an axe handle, Kate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, oh. the, the, yeah. The beating of the, I, I had somebody, uh, so they have rules. Uh, they don't follow them very well, but they have rules. So they're not supposed to steal from prospects. Right. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll treat, they, it's a mental, like they'll physically, I, I would go, so I would go to mandatory and one mandatory, my feet were just bleeding. Just for, I had to walk the perimeter. And, um, you know, I, I slept maybe an hour and four days. Um, you didn't really eat. I lost eight pounds over that time. Um and you're, you're either on patrol, you're picking up trash, you're cooking, building tents, and then you're hiding out during witching hours. Uh, but this one instance, I was coming up, um, I was in Pennsylvania, and I was coming up a, a path. I had been sent up to the upper field to get something. And uh, there's a group of pagans that were hanging out there. And, and uh, they made, one of them said, hey, prospect, come over here. And, you know, it's not, a, they're not asking. And so you go walking over and, and I had been doing some stuff. So my chain had, had was hanging out of my uh, t-shirt, which was underneath my prospect uh, vest. And he said, hey, what's, let me see that. So I kind of held it up and, and, and showed him the chain from a distance. I knew where this was going. And yeah. uh, he's like, no, I said, I want to see it, take it off. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. And I had gotten this chain, you know, before I got, uh, you know, went on with ATF, my mother had given it to me. Um, and it, you know, it's a, it's crucifix with a, uh, our shamrock to, for protection mm-hmm. and it worked so far. So I wasn't about to give it up. And, um, and so somebody else said, you heard what he said, you know, and so this guy came at me, I knew it was going to be on. So I ended up getting him onto the ground, but then the rest of them came and I just, you know, I got beaten with ax handles and everything else. And luckily for me, a, uh, uh, one of the presidents happened to come up the same path. And um, he, he's like, hey, what, he, he basically broke it up. He's like, what the hell's going on here? And so, of course, I didn't say anything. I wasn't going to rat anybody out. And mm-hmm. so, and they're like, oh, it was a misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. It was this, that. And it kind of broke up. They never got the chain. Um, you know, I was uh, I was banged up pretty good, but, um, you know, nothing that I wasn't going to heal from. So, um, you know, that's, that's just kind of the stuff that you went through. And then in the prospecting stage, 
there was, if you screwed up, you could get the lifts thing was a bang check. So it's basically a, a uh, palm strike to the head mm-hmm. um, or you could get a ax handle or you, you could get days added. And honestly, I don't know what's worse, the bang check to the head or get days added to prospecting. Right. Or you can get beaten and thrown out. And um, so it, it, they would come up to you and regularly ask you how many days or they'd ask you about the history of the club or they'd ask you all sorts of crazy things. And if you didn't have an answer, an answer they liked, or sometimes they would just put you in a situation where you couldn't win. Um, you're like, you're not supposed to touch anything that says pagans. And I had a pagan throw colors at me. Mm-hmm. So I, you can't let colors hit the ground. So what do you do? You Matrix can't touch it. You can't let it hit yeah. the ground. So oh, you're yeah. screwed. You yeah. know? And they're setting you up, you know, um, just for those. So, so this is basically tell- like Marine Corps boot camp, but in hell. Like it, yeah. but the most nightmarish possible version. Everyone's playing, we call them fuck fuck games, but you're stuck in these fuck yep. fuck games. You're fucked either way. There's no winning. Part in the language, yep. but yeah, right. I love part in the language she said to the former pagan. Uh, but yeah. you know, <laughs> you may no, have heard you know, it all. Uh, you know, there was, and I, this is their term for their wives or girlfriends, their old ladies. Yep. Um, one of the old ladies said, Hey, um, all they are is evil boy scouts, and and they because they, they have all the patches and all these things mean something. Um, yeah. and their colors are most important to them. Um, and you know, right now. A set of pagans colors, a hell's angel pay ten thousand dollars for them. Like yeah. they're they're worth a lot for and I, they told me when I was prospecting, I had a mother club member come up, said, You kill a hell's angel and bring me as colors, your prospecting ends today. Wow, holy shit. And so you're doing this. Meanwhile, you're checking in with the ATF, who I'm assuming they wanted to know everything. So like you had to probably tell them that night that you got in that fight and you know, you're whatever. Or at any point, did you have to keep convincing them, let me keep going? Or were they like you're crushing it. I know this sucks, but keep going. So it was a little bit of both. Um, I will say this, there was um, 99% of what I, um, you know, happened. I would, I would tell them, I did not tell them about that being the case agent. Some others knew about it, but I didn't, yeah. it didn't go into a report because it would give some folks reasons. Cause there was, there was an internal battle. There were some that, oh, you sure. know, everyone was like, Oh, Hey, do this. You know, we want you to do this and go ahead. And then all of a sudden it starts getting, a little bit dicey and there's a couple of folks who were more worried about their careers than they were about you know my safety or the case mm-hmm. and they were like we gotta shut this down because this will look bad right. if he gets killed right. um and so that was it was a constant battle that went on during that now 99 percent of the folks in atf are awesome and we're oh, super yeah. supportive um but you always have that one or two you know and i'm you start in the military it's like hey you better not screw up my advancement up the food chain oh yeah um, so yeah. many parallels here but so yeah. you make it through though you make it through as a prospect and we talk about, I'm going to keep using the parallels because it's so striking to me, but uh, again, not slightly worse version with the pagans, much more good (laughs) vibes on the Marine Corps side. But the day that we get our EGAs at the end of boot camp is one of the proudest. It doesn't matter how tough you are. You have a tear streaming down your face and you feel like you're part of something. It's such an incredible feeling. What was, I want to call it your pinning, but it's your, you get your badge. What was it like when you find your patch? patched in so um being patched in was an interesting story so you never know when that's coming right it's not like six months and all of a sudden you look at your watch and you're like ah i made it It, it's not like that it's very vague and so um the church is where they do all their criminal planning and so you have church yeah they call it church yeah um and it's once a week and it's done by the chapter and you have to be there Mm -hmm. and um and so sometimes church no electronics are allowed in church there were times that we would have to be stripped down naked and we'd be sitting there having these conversations. They always had an RF detector where they were wanting you for a, a wire transmitter. Um, so very secretive in, in um, you know, when, when those sessions were held. So this, it, sometimes prospects were allowed in, sometimes they weren't. So I was a prospect in this particular church session, I was allowed in. So we were in there and, and talking through a bunch of stuff. Church ended and they handed me a bunch of doc- documents that we had created during church and uh, they wanted me to burn them in the grill out behind the president's house. So I walked out and I had these documents and a lighter and I went to the grill and, and one of the pagans followed me out, Izzo, and he's there and he's just bullshitting with me at the grill. I like the documents on fire, but it's almost like he's watching me, but whatever. So I burned the documents. They're, they're almost done. And, and I hear, hey, prospect. And usually when it was just the chapter, they wouldn't call me prospect. When you were in the, the big environments where it was the big club, they would, it was always prospect this project that, but they would call me Ken. And so um, I turned back and the Sergeant Arms and the national and the, uh, the chapter president were standing in the doorway. They're like, get back in here. 
So I go walking towards the door and it just seemed like a weird vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm walking towards the door and I go up and there's like a mud room to a kitchen to a living room. And um, as I get to the kitchen piece, Izzo's right behind me, like, like in my space, like right behind me. And I, out of the corner of my eye, I can see he's got a handgun mm -hmm. in his hand. And which is really unusual. Uh, like mm -hmm. that's not normal for just when the chapters, especially at church. Um, and so as I go into the living room, there's a peg, uh, pagan known as Hogman. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the book, Hogman is one of the most vile individuals. Um, Sounds like he had a it. blood fetish. I, I won't get into all, he had a blood fetish. He was just a nasty human being. But he's, he's sitting there with a, a shotgun and he's got a point at my head. And so now I got Izzo and I can feel his breath in the back of my neck. I can see the chrome handgun. I got Hogman with a shotgun pointed at me. And um, the Sergeant at Arms hands me this paper and, and he says, read it. So I'm reading it to myself. And he's like, listen, idiot, read it out loud. And so I start reading it and it's about being a rat or an informant. And I'm mm -hmm. like, holy shit, they figured it out. They, they know. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to get out of this? You know, and, and I don't have a transmitter cover team which is miles away anyways, but they're never going to get there. And so there was a plate glass window in the living room. I'm like, no matter what happens here, I'm getting through that plate glass window, at least yeah. so somebody will know. Um, so, the, so I'm reading through this thing and, I'm, and then he makes me read it again. And I'm like, and it's getting heated. He's like yelling. And I'm like, I, and I can't figure out like I'm, in my head, I'm like, how, how did they figure it out from the, the beginning of church to the end of church? Anyways, long story short, the, the chapter president walks down the hallway, comes back, uh, corner of my eye, he throws something at my head. And so just instinctively, I duck and put my hands up and it hits it and, it's, it, and I end up catching it. It's, it's a, um, a rolled up t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And so I unroll the t-shirt and it's what they call a soft patch, which is basically the pagan colors on a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that he gave that, told me that, hey, you got patched in, you made it. And then the big congratulations and all this stuff. Um, Your mom and dad come out. Every there's yeah, yeah, cake yeah, and there's tea and take, for take everyone. A photo. <laughs> yeah, it's really your grandma's there. It's very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I was like, hey, I don't give a rat's ass about this T-shirt. I just, I'm just glad I'm going to be able to walk out of this place right now. Yeah, and from a human aspect of it, you had to have been fucking pumped, right? Like you made it. Like you know, this is like the bad guys. But didn't you feel some sort of like? So, you know, I will say it probably took about 15 minutes. Church ended. Uh, I had one of the pagans come up and it's like, if you turn out to be a rat, we're going to kill you. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I'll so you put a damper on, on it. it. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I, uh, I got in a car with Sergeant Arms and um, we were driving to uh, grab coffee and it kind of hit me. I was like, holy cow, I'm the first one who's ever done this. And, um, and also I was like, in this was falsely, I was like, life is going to get so much better. I'm now a patch member. I can move, you know, around without being under the gun all the time and, you know, whatever. It, the fact is, though, it's not because you're always beholden to the gang. There's always people over you. There's always demands on you. Even when I went into officer status, there's still mother clubs above you. Like there's always something. So, but at the time it made me feel better. Yeah. And so you, now that you're in it, it is it a full-time job or do these guys have like regular day jobs and then at night they're pagans or is it a full-time gig? So it, it, it depends uh, as far as the job part. Some have jobs. I mean, there was one pagan who worked on wall street and he did a lot of the money laundering and set up the LLCs and all that stuff. Um, uh -huh. Most of, I would say, you know, 25% um, maybe had real jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest were, you know, making the money off of drugs or extortions or, or whatever it was. You had like, they were pretty good about like, you know, if you're slinging hamburgers at McDonald's, they weren't going to, you know, have you leave mid shift mm -hmm. unless something drastic was happening. And um, so, you know, there was that kind of dynamic. And so, I'm assuming you didn't have too much free time that this like kind of took over your whole entire life. Did they have you doing illegal things like, and then if you got caught because you did get arrested and spend time in jail at one point, correct? Like, how did that work? I did. And so, yeah, so I had authorization from the director of ATF and the U S attorney's office to participate in what they call tier one and tier two crimes. So mm -hmm. I could be involved in criminal activity and you just have to report on it. And what, now I couldn't go out and kill somebody or something like that, but you could, you know, criminal activity where people weren't going to get hurt or like, you know, you could do drug trafficking, arms trafficking, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so the, um, but they were all, even when you thought you were going to have downtime, they always 
something came up and you were beholden to the club and you had to be there. Um, and so like, you never really got to relax. And, uh, even when I was able, so part of my backstory was that I worked at a garage, Mm -hmm. um, as a mechanic. And then uh, the other part was that I post lobsters. And so, and the reason why I picked that was in, in, and I'll tell you funny side stories, like you can hypnotize lobsters. If you run behind their eyes, you can actually get them into a catatonic state. And so I early on brought down some lobsters for mass and I was at an event at the chapter president's house and I hypnotized a bunch of them had to stand up in the bar and that's it. They were like, shit, this guy's going to be a lobster man. Cause who the hell else <laughs> to hypnotize a lobster? So that poaching lobsters was um, the one way that I could say, Hey, I'm going out poaching and they couldn't track me. Right. You know, my wife would tell me, she'd be like, listen, even when you're here, you're not here um, because the phone would ring or worse yet. I was always wondering like what's happening. Cause it was almost worse when you disengaged and had to re-engage than being there. Cause you could see how things develop when you're there. And when, yep. when you come back, it's like, okay, what's changed. So um, it was never really a relaxation piece. And, and I assume you really had to be working at that mechanics garage, correct? So I had um, a lot of uh, backstopping in there. There was photos of me in there. Um, yeah. There were folks there that, and they actually, the pagans went and did surveillance yeah um, and showed up at the garage um, right and you know luckily it passed you know the backstopping piece of this is it's not an exact science and you do your best but like when I got arrested you know I had a, a, a criminal history I was a convicted felon mm-hmm. and, and I, my, the felony I chose was a bad choice I choose that uh, for assaulting a police officer mm-hmm. um but that I figured that that'd look great to bikers right yeah um, didn't look so good to the cops when I got arrested though um, right but that yeah. So it's like, if I had to do it again, I'd pick differently, but, um, that, but even that when, you know, um, you hoping that your backstory stands up. And so like, so on, on that, and you alluded to before I was, there was a, um, a bunch of out of town pagans were, were, um, out on Rocky point. And so, and they were talking about going after hell's angels clubhouse and doing a bunch of stuff. So, we brought some gang units in to heat up the area. Now the gang units, none of the locals knew that there was an undercover, but we just said, Hey, we got some Intel, whatever. So they come out and heated it up and it was good because it, it quieted down the area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought they'd all left and I was hungry. I wanted to go get something to eat. Didn't want to leave. I had a gun and I didn't want to leave it in the clubhouse because for fear the cops would come back and these guys would use it. And they, they had other guns there, but I want to add one more to it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to walk down the street with it in case I got jacked up. I'd have a gun on cruiser comes whipping up. Um, next thing I'm prone out. Long story short, um, they searched the truck, got the gun. Mm-hmm. And um, so I got locked up and, yeah. uh, you know, not, not part of the plan. It added some street cred, but it, it created a lot of problems for us. Cause they don't want you under scrutiny anyway. Right. Like that, that's another part of it, I'm sure. But well, yeah. And, and their rule is they have lots of rules. And the rule is, is that you, if one, if you're arrested until your case is cleared, you're supposed to disengage from the club. You're on your own. They, right. They, yeah. Cause they don't, they, cause that's where rats come from. So they were like, you know, but for me, they made an exception and they're like, Hey, other than, you know, we're going to let slam. And there's, there's a church video. Like this is, I actually got video of church. Um, and in that they talk about the fact that they made me an officer. You're supposed to be in the club a year before you can even you know, think about being an officer. They made me an officer quicker. And then I, my criminal, they used me as an example. They said, Hey, slam's doing a great job, but nobody else is going to, if you got a case, you're, you're gone until your case is resolved. If you're new into the club, you're not going to be an officer. So they broke the rules for me. And, and I think they probably lived and regret it later on. Oh, I'm sure. Now at the time I was talking about, like, did you feel excited when you got welcomed into the group? Was there a time you ever felt yourself kind of slipping into an affection for some of these guys? Like what did it become difficult? Cause you went so far into it. You were in it for years that you started to be like, Hey, checking in with yourself, like not you, fall too far into it or. Yeah. You know, it, it's a great question. And, and I, you know, I liked some more than others. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I never, uh, you know, most of the time you're living at such, your, your brain is working at such a high level in activity. And I say that not because, you know, I'm smart or anything like that. It's about when, you know, you brought up at the beginning, like telling lies. So, you know, and I always use this analogy to explain it to people. Like if I asked you make up a lie to me and tell me about where you went to dinner last night, what you had, who you with, what you were wearing and and how was the meal prepared? You could sling that out and I'd buy it, you know, whatever it is. 
But then I'm going to come back a week from now and I'm going to say, how was that steak cooked that you had last week? That's really hard to do because it's not an ingrained memory. It's not a real memory. It's right. a memory of a lie. So, you know, when you're doing this, at some point you do get fatigued and, and the way out is to take the case down. And for me, some of the frustration got to be like, we had targeted times. It was never supposed to be two years and we we're going to take it down after one year. And then it was a year and three months and a year and six months. And it kept getting put off and that got to be frustrating um, because you wanted out, but you couldn't because there were certain things that were happening that you had to stay in for. Right. And, and you were married during this time too. I heard you say how, I mean, cause are you allowed to say what's going on to your partner or is it so undercover? And I would think about the stress and the worry on my end that I would be feeling every time you walked out the door that had to take a huge toll on your personal life. So my wife, um, was an agent also. Yeah. Um, and so that made it good because she knew it was going she could on. She understand. It it, right. But it made it bad because she understood. Right. Um, yeah. So it was a mixed bag. And, and you know, we had uh, three daughters and they were younger at the time. And so, you know, she's, you know, an agent and she's, you know, basically running the household. So it put a lot on her and she kept a lot from me because she knew like I was overloaded with what was going on. She wanted mm -hmm. me to focus on what I was doing. So, um, there, you know, there was that dynamic and, and it certainly puts a lot of stress on a marriage. Like no marriage counselor is going to tell you, Hey, you should go into cover for two years. It's going to strengthen your relationship. Um, and so over time, you know, there was, you know, times that you just kind of, the family moves on without you. And mm -hmm. so it's like their lives are happening. Um, and, and even, like I said, the interaction's not as genuine because you're not really there. And, so next thing you know, you're like, wait, when did that happen? And they're like, well, four months ago. Mm -hmm. um, now there were, there were some upsides. There was, um, my oldest had her first boyfriend. Um, you know, this is like when they're dating, like, you know, you're playing shooting hoops in the driveway type thing. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to sneak away and, and my family didn't know I was uh, coming home and um, I was coming into our neighborhood, which is a quiet suburban neighborhood on my bike. And I, I just been on a mandatory and I was full leathers. Uh, I didn't have my colors on, uh, but yeah. I hadn't showered in days. So I looked really bad. And um, so I, my daughter knew the sound of the bike. And so she, we had a long drive and she's, she's running down the driveway as I come around the corner and, and pull in. And so I, you know, shut the bike off, jump off, give her a big hug. And she's all excited that I'm there. And, and then I look up and I see this kid and his eyes are the size of footballs. And he's like, holy shit, that's your father. <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? Yeah. yeah. And like, he didn't know, he was trembling when I went, I tried to like de-escalate <laughs> the whole thing, try to shake yeah. his hand. I think I made it worse. <laughs> and um, needless to say, within 24 hours, he was a, uh, he was gone. He uh, was an ex-boyfriend. Yeah, it was a little too much for the, uh, and then, so finally though, like you said, you were kind of hoping, like, let's draw this case to an end. You, you finally draw it to an end. What had you been hoping you would get out of this case? What was the, the goal and what did you end up accomplishing? So, you know, it, the whole way through it, you're building, like, again, you could script out and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. But, you know, it, the cards are dealt to you daily as you, oh, you yeah. go along. But the one thing I said is that I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not committing to this to get a bunch of bikers for stolen motorcycle parts or things like that. We're either going to go all in, try to get to, you know, mother club and we're going to go after legit charges mm -hmm. or we're not going to do it at all. And right. so we started working towards that, but it, like, as the case is going on? And I always said, this is like dumb luck, which would help in the case. And then it was dumb luck that just kept me around. But like th things in, in one of the reasons why I was like, Hey, this has to end because people are always like, Oh, you worried the pagans going to kill you. Well, yeah, sure. You know, if, if they found out, and especially is, is they would realize how much evidence you had on them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Number two was, um, it, you know, every, the, the hell's angels were a big threat. Um, the motorcycle itself was a threat. And so like th there were two different instances, one where, um, I was supposed to be doing guard duty in front of the, the clubhouse. I gotten kicked out of the club. It's kind of a long story, but it had nothing to do with me, but a, a national vice president tried to take over the club, become the president. He got beaten out of the club and everyone he vouched for got thrown out. So I got thrown out. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't out doing guard duty. Well, that night, the Hells Angels surrounded the club and the Sergeant Arms was out there and they beat him near to death, um, beat him with ball peen hammers. Um, and it, it, it was it was a horrible um, you know, situation. He got med flighted out. He ultimately survived. But that would have been me standing mm -hmm. there. I hadn't got kicked out of the club. And another example was Hogman. This guy I told you, it, you know, not the, the, the greatest of humans. 
um, we had pulled out, we'd been on this long run and I was the highest ranking person when we got back and the chapter president sent us out. Highest ranking rides front lap. And we pulled out chapter president's house and, and he was the vice president, which has no status unless the president dies. Mm-hmm. Do I pull out front left because I'm the highest ranking pagan? He pulls around me to get to the front left. And it's like, okay, I'm a make-believe biker. I don't really care. You want to ride front left? Ride front right. Left. We made it maybe a quarter mile down the road and he got splattered by a minivan. And uh, and it wasn't Holy his shit. fault. It, it was the minivan's fault and it would have been me. Um, and so it's like, okay, how many times, and he coded out, they actually brought him back to life. He coded out three times, they brought him back to life. Um, but like, how many times are you going to be able to play Russian roulette where it's not going to go off on you? And so, right. you know, at some point you're like, hey, you've got to, you know, we've got to wrap this thing up. Wow. So <laughs> back to you, and I know I just digressed and didn't no, get to No, no, that's, no, that's incredible. Yeah. It, it, the, a lot of luck. So in, in the end, um, the first phase of this, uh, we took down 20 uh, pagans and the charges range from um, attempted murder, murder conspiracy, um, explosives, traffic. I bought um, bombs and, and, and that's a story we're sharing. Um, firearms, um, armed narcotics trafficking. Um, so there are a lot of very substantive um, charges. Um, that were brought against and, and ultimately in the long run, um, everybody, there was a bunch of motions, the court process went on for about four years, um, but ultimately nobody went to trial. The evidence was overwhelming. I had 1200 hours of recordings, audio recordings, about 200 hours of video recordings. Um, they ultimately all um, pled guilty and, um, and were sentenced. Wow. And you, I mean, what, so you didn't have to go to trial did they even find out that you were the rat then? Not so. I'm not saying rat. Sorry, I don't know how to say it. But like, <laughs> so, did they even find out you were the rat? Like, no, I've yeah. watched a lot of mafia movies lately. But yeah. um, how how what happens at, at the end then? Like, you just disappear, and they have to know it's you. Yeah. So they knew. Um, so the night of um, the night of the takedown, the, it initiated about one o'clock in the morning. I was doing a, a large meth deal with a, an individual known as Hellboy. He was an MMA fight, really bad person. And mm-hmm. they wanted, they didn't want to go in the house after him. So they're like, Hey, if you can lure him out, do this deal, we'll rip him on the street. We'll hold him on ice. And then we'll do the search warrants at 6 AM and, and all the arrest warrants. And so they ultimately, I did this deal with him. Um, they, they arrested him. Um, and they told him, they said, Hey, um, slams a cop. And he wouldn't, he refused to believe it. He's like, listen, I believe a lot of pagans might be a cop slam. No way is slam a cop. Um, and he, he did not, he wouldn't believe it. And so they went and did the execute the search warrants um, and the arrest warrants and they recovered a bunch more firearms. They um, got some more explosive devices, um, you know, and, and I said earlier on the explosive device, and I think it's, it, it's, it's a very quick story, but entertaining to, yeah, to show that you don't always have control. Um, you know, I knew they had these bombs and they were legit devices. And um, I kept trying to get to them or figure out where they were so we could get to them. Were, get I know they beat for the mafia. I know they beat, but like, what what were the bombs for? So they referred to them as Christmas presents. And in part of the underlying murder conspiracy is they were going to use these Christmas presents. The plan was to blow up Hells Angels uh, um, gas station. It was a family-owned gas station. They were going to blow up the gas station. They were going to lob these things off an overpass of the freeway when the Hells Angels were on a run um underneath and so they would not that they these um the high explosives were wrapped with steel bars and so you know being the military you know that shrapnel and the damage that's not just going to take out a bunch of bikers it's going to take out everyone on the long island freeway yeah um so we were like hey we have to figure out who the bomb maker is number one number two where are they and so if i had said when i was on long island like hey i'm gonna blow up kate it's mm-hmm. well, they're not going to give me a bomb to go blow up Kate. They're going to go blow up Kate. So I would have no control over, you know, how to do it. So I tied it back to my lobstering backstory. And I said, Hey, lobstering gets ugly out there. And it does, you know, legitimately if we're out there poaching lobsters, like lobstermen take that stuff real serious. And so I got into a running gun battle, blah, blah, blah. The guy put sugar in the tanks in my boat. I'm going to blow up his boat. I want to sink it. So they're like, Oh, you know, we might be able to hook you up, but it was nothing definitive. And mm-hmm. so um, Izzo, um, one of the pagans, had come up to, I, part of my backstory also, I did collections for my boss. He, he mm-hmm. did some long chart and I did some collections. So he came up to help me on those. And um, we, we met at the 99, grabbed a bite to eat, had a beer. Um, 
And all of a sudden I get up to go to the bathroom and, and he follows me in the bathroom. It's kind of weird. Um, and so I'm at the urinal, I'm going to the bathroom. He's like kind of standing behind me. He's got a trench coat on. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? So I finished turn and he opens his trench coat almost like a flasher. And he's got one of these bombs in his pocket, like inside the trench coat. And I'm like, holy shit, we're in a 99 restaurant. He's got a bomb in here. Mm -hmm. Um, So now I got to get him out of this restaurant and not look like I'm freaking out about a bomb being in a 99 restaurant. And so I'm like, all right, hey, listen, bro, why don't you you go by the car? I'm going to play the tab. We got to get going. We got to go make these collections. And so we got out there and I was like, hey, listen, um, the boat's not in right now because he wanted to go blow the boat up and I didn't have a boat to blow up. Right. So he's, um, I'm like, the boat's out. He's like, oh, we can wait. I'm like, dude, they go up two, three days. I said, listen, my boss will give us a couple hundred bucks. Let's just, and there was a Dunkin' Donuts big cup there. I said, let's yeah. put, put this thing in here and leave it here. And then let's go do the collection. So we left it in my car and we took his car and went and did the collections. And then ultimately, you know, he wanted the money. So he, he kept the money and I said, listen, I'll use this thing. And then, you know, that's that. And so he's like, okay. Um, so he took off and, um, and the bomb squad came and, and they were like, Hey, if this thing went off here, all of us would be dead. Wow. Um, and, but the funny thing is the pagans aren't stupid. When we got back the next day, we had uh, church and Sergeant arms brought up in church. He's like, where's the Christmas present? And I'm like, Oh, it, you know, got used. And he's like, you know, who says that cops, we don't leave explosives behind. That's what cops do, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking he was talking about me. I'm like, Oh man, this gig's up. Yeah. But what he, what he assumed was my boss was the cop. Ah. And he's like, and he's like, if I end up in a fucking jail cell, you two clowns, but I hope you're nowhere near me because I'm going to kill both of you. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I want proof that that boat went. I said, well, you know, I'm a diver. I said, I'll go get photos, whatever. And anyway, long story short, they eventually forgot about it and it went yeah. off, but it things like that, like you can't plan for. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have made it a single day. I wouldn't have lasted <laughs> one single day. I would have been like, all right, I got something to tell you guys. <laughs> I, yeah. That's, that's just crazy. Now, do you still, once the case ended, I mean, you have a family, you have, were there threats against you or I, what was the aftermath? Yeah. So afterwards they, uh, so they put out two contracts on me, um, you know, uh, to have me killed. And uh, there was some active movement on their part. Um, and there was investigation launched, um, and they, 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 they was active. They weren't able to, um, they, they were able to show that it was happening. They weren't able to prove who was driving, uh, mm-hmm. you know, behind it. Um, they had, you know, um, agents, you know, guarding me for, for months. Um, they monitor also, I mean, I won't go into all the details, but mm-hmm. and still to this day, my agency, you know, monitors a whole lot of things to make sure yeah. that. Nobody's circling, looking for me. Um, you know, it, it'd be a mistake to come after me because they'll they'll find out. You know, right. Really quickly, but, yeah. Um, but yeah. So you know. But listen, you you take precautions. You look over your shoulder, and um, you know. And then the transition back to normal life. It's a transition. It's not. Um, it's not like something you do overnight. I, I imagine going back to your desk at the ATF after that for for a few weeks or months or whatever isn't the same. Isn't the same thrill as hopping on your Harley and going out to sell meth with the pagans, you know, so yeah, they, a slightly different vibe. Yeah. And they give you time, you know, they give you a period to kind of unwind and reconnect with your family. But the, you know, when you're in long-term undercover that you have to see a, a shrink every six months to make sure you're not going to the dark side. Cause we've lost people to the dark side. Yeah. But you know, if you ask a shrink, they'll tell you, Oh no, hell no. I could smoke you out. I have a good buddy of mine. He's like, I'd pick you out if, if you went to the dark side right out of the gate. But yeah. Um, the transition back though is, you know, it's weird because the family's moved on. And, and you're trying to get caught back up. And mm-hmm. so from my wife and I, we, we, it was a concerted effort where we basically just started dating again. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we would designate times a couple times a week where we would just go on dates. Sometimes we'd be at home and just tell the girls, Hey, we're not here. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we were able to, you know, build it back over time. And, and I will tell you, you know, things happen for a reason. And, um, you know, my wife's always famous for saying that, but in the end, our relationship was never stronger. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think at some level, you kind of appreciate what you, like, I, I think people take people for granted until they, you know, it, until that becomes at risk. Yeah. And then when you get it back, you're like, hey, you know what? Th- this is why I got into this marriage in the first place. And this is why I'm not going to let it go stale. Yeah. And I imagine now that the book is out and you're doing like your family has to, because I'm sure there's things that even, especially your kids didn't even know about. How, how has their reaction been to finding all this out about you? 
You know, they're in an age now where they, they understand it a lot more. They were younger then, although they knew, uh, you know, like we always try, we never had conversations in front of them about what was going on, but they saw their dad look like a shit bag. Kids are um, smart. Yeah. They, yeah. kids know more and than it, you think. It, it, yeah. And they heard things like, you know, my daughter, um, two of my daughters play hockey. And, and so I went, was at one of the games and I seen one of the girls um, on the bench and she had said to me, Hey coach, we hadn't seen you around. Cause I used to coach the team and, and I'm like, uh, I said, yeah, I've been busy with work. She goes, yeah, we heard you were partying with Roblox. I'm like, oh my God, like how do they even heard that name? And so you do realize that they, they knew a lot more. Um, they're the big reason, them and my wife, because um, I had no intention of writing a book. Um, and they were the big reason why they're like, hey, this story needs to be told. It needs to be, you know, memorialized because someday you're not going to be around and, and mm-hmm. people need to know, like, this is the type of work that you know, ATF does and that law enforcement does and that um, there's a lot that goes into it. So, yeah. you know, ultimately they, they, they are what drove me to do it. And final question, do you still love to ride? Do you still like to get out there or has that kind of ruined it for you? Like, uh, no, you know what? Magic Great. is gone. Great question. I, um, so I had a bike um, before the case and during mm-hmm. the case. And then of course I had my undercover bike. But um, when I came out, I sold my bike. Yeah, I was done riding. Um, the riding was not, you know, um, you're riding a hundred miles an hour, you're riding a gear mm-hmm. down, you're two feet off the person in front of you. Um, and believe it or not, everyone thinks bikers can really know how to ride a bike. Some are really good, others not so much. Yeah. Um, so um, I had gotten away from it for a few years, other than I was still doing some undercover work. And so I was still using the bike for some of that, but not for joy. And, um, but recently I've gotten back into riding again and, yeah. and all that. So it's, it's, it's come back, but it was a while, you know, when I didn't. Sometimes you got to step away for the, uh, then I was a minivan guy for a few years and just really keeping it on four <laughs> wheels. And then, and then I guess I do have one last question. I'm probably keeping you too long here. No, uh, no, no, no. I kept saying through the beginning, I'm like, wow, there's so many military parallels to this. Did you see a high number of military personnel in these groups? Cause I know a lot of guys go looking for brotherhood after they get out and yada, yada. Was that part of the reason it was structured the way it was? Was there a lot of military? So there were some, I wouldn't say a lot. I will yeah. say this. So there's, you know, there's, I mean, you, you, the term one percenter comes that only one percent are outlaws and that comes back from military study back in the fifties. But the reality is there were definitely some ex-military that were in there, but there was ex everything in there. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. so and now we would go to events, biker events. And so they would be, you know, dubbed pagan events, meaning that outlaw organization controlled it from the outlaw side, mm-hmm. but there'd be all sorts of other biker gangs. And there were a lot of military biker you know, groups and not gangs at clubs. Yeah. Yeah. There were law enforcement ones. And in some cases, law enforcement ones acted worse than, than, <laughs> than the, uh, the outlaw ones, but yeah. they, um, so there were a lot of groups, but inside the pagans, there were some, but you know, I know there's some people out there saying, oh, these, it's all ex-military and this, that, and, the other. and, it, and it, that's not what I saw. Okay. Uh, you know, a percentage of it, but I will say there's a lot of military who are in bike clubs. And mm-hmm. I think part yeah. of it is that, and they have that structure. They'll have sergeant arms. I always laugh about it because I'm like, what, like, what, what arms do you have? You know, yeah. like, what, what, but I think it's because to your point, they like that brotherhood. They like that structure. And so they gravitate to that, but then, it's a good I, model to, yeah. To and I, I don't think right. most are gravitating to being outlaws. And yeah. that's what these guys are. They're outlaw criminal organization. Well, super interesting. Riding with Evil, Ken Croak. Uh, again, Sons of Anarchy meets Departed is the is such a great description. Uh, and I basically, where can you get the book? Um, you, it's it's everywhere. And, and I wrote it yeah. uh, with my partner, Dave Wedge, who did a great job of taking my story and turning it into a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's everywhere. It's Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and almost every bookstore. And uh, So I appreciate that plug and hopefully people like it. Very cool. I would ask, where can people find you? But I'm not going to this time. I'm going to let that one fly. Uh, Ken, thank you so much.